before the establishment of the Roman Orthodox Church, dating back to the first century AD, the Gnostics were a sect of Christians with a very different set of beliefs from what the new blossoming religion of Christianity would soon become. The Gnostics insisted they were in fact the original Christians, and that the Roman Church were impostors, co-opting and changing their mythology. Many original founders, like Marcion and Tatian, were actually devout Gnostics who would later leave the Orthodoxy, claiming the Church was, quote, setting up the fraud of historic Christianity. Gnosticism continued to flourish alongside the Roman Church until it was declared heresy and outlawed by Emperor Constantine in 325 AD. Once the Orthodox Bible became canonized, all extra-biblical Gnostic Gospels were considered heretical and either hidden or destroyed on threat of death. By the turn of the next century, any remaining Gnostics still openly practicing were hunted down as heretics. The Gnostics believed that there existed only one true absolute God, which the ancient Greeks referred to as Agnostos Theos, the unknown or unknowable God. This one true God, also called the Monad, was ultimate and perfect, existing completely outside of creation, impossible to know or understand from our limited human perspective, described in the Apocryphon of John as illimitable, unfathomable, immeasurable, invisible, eternal, unutterable, and unnameable. This unknowable God produced a diverse group of spiritual beings called the Aeons, who lived in a heavenly dimension of fullness known as the Pleroma. Among the Aeons was a goddess named Sophia, who decided she wished to birth a divine being of her own without the involvement of a male partner, and without approval from her father, the one true God. The being she birthed was described as a miscarriage or abortion, quote, having a serpent-like body with the head of a lion, and Sophia named him Yaldabaoth. The Gnostic texts referred to this creature as the Demiurge, or the godlike self-willed, who became a tyrannical, maniacal, selfish creator god himself. First he produced a race of powerful minions called Archons to assist him. Then together they created their own world to rule over, which was a broken mirror image of the Pleroma. Next, the Demiurge and Archons created and animated the animals of the world, filling the land with cattle, the seas with fish, and the sky with birds. Finally, they attempted to create man, the copy of a heavenly being known as Adam, but they could not breathe life into him and failed to animate his body. Seeing this as an opportunity, Sophia and some other aeons from the Pleroma sent by the Monad came upon the Demiurge and insisted they could help breathe life into his Adam. A divine spark from Sophia was then bestowed upon man, bringing him to life and allowing all humans afterwards to contain this divine light within themselves. This spark of true light from the Pleroma made man more pure and more powerful than the Demiurge, which infuriated and made him jealous. To satisfy his spite, he made man mortal, and placed him in a paradisical realm called the Garden of Eden, filled with material delights made to distract him from his divinity. As you may have guessed by now, this Demiurge Yaldabaoth is better known in the Bible as Yahweh, or Jehovah, in the Old Testament, where he's presented as though he is the monad, the one true God. In reality, however, as evidenced by several of the Gnostic Gospels removed from the Bible, Yahweh is actually only one of many lesser gods. In the Apocryphon of John it was written, When he saw creation surrounding him, and the throng of angels around him, who had come forth from him, he said to them, I am a jealous God, and there is no other God beside me. But by announcing this, he suggested to the angels with him that there is another God. For if there were no other God, of whom would he be jealous? Jose Aragon wrote, In the first centuries of our era, many of the Gnostic sects viewed the Creator God not as a good or just being, but as a satanic one. Many of them likened him to Satan. Gustavo Adolfo Becker relates in one of his accounts how the creator god Brahma created worlds, like bubbles, and how he experimented with them, as sometimes they turned out good and sometimes not. The creator god is not a completely perfect god, but apparently quite inept. There are worlds which turn out badly 
and he has to destroy them. There are worlds that turn out better. He tries, practices, creates through trial and error. The Bible says, quote, God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light, that it was good. How? Didn't he know? Didn't he know it was something good? That is why Gnostics say, we are in the presence of a creator ignorant of the effects of his creation. Likewise, the creator God always maintains that he is the only one. He doesn't say it once, he says it all the time. He's constantly saying it, I am the only God, there is no other God, I, your God, am the only one, etc. We all know that when someone repeats the same thing over and over again, it's because they're not sure of what they're saying, which is why they have to repeat it so often. The Gnostic's interpretation of this is that the Creator suspects, since he is not altogether sure, that there is another God higher than him, a God infinitely more superior to him, much bigger, much more important than him, and that is what he's trying to hide by incessantly repeating, I am the only one, there is no other God. The fact that Yahweh wasn't the only Creator God is also evidenced within the Bible, such as the very first sentence, Bereshit bara Elohim, which translates to, in the beginning, the gods created. Because Elohim in Hebrew is not singular, but plural, meaning gods or lords. Also, in Genesis 1.26, where, quote, God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. The use of plural pronouns like us and our implies Yahweh wasn't creating alone. Several books removed from the Bible make it clear who and why. In the Apocryphon of John, it is written that Yaldabaoth said to the archons with him, Come, let us create a human being after the image of God and with a likeness to ourselves, so that this human image may give us light. In other words, the Demiurge and his minions together created humanity in order to steal our light power. Gnostic texts differentiate between true light from the monad and false light from the Demiurge, such as in the Pistis Sophia, where it is written that Sophia had been deluded through the godlike self-willed Demiurge, and had not been deluded through anything else, save through a light power, because of its resemblance to the light in which she had had faith. Being an emanation and emissary of the true light, Sophia essentially represents the modern Christian equivalent of the Holy Spirit. She created the Demiurge in error upon descending to a lower heaven, but quickly recognizing her mistake, withheld from him and his archon minions the ability to hold within them the true light. Sophia then weeps, repents, and apologizes to the unknowable God, who forgives her and devises his own plan. He sends other aeons from the Pleroma to help breathe life into Yahweh's Adam, and when they do, give the divine light power, the Holy Spirit, to humanity. This makes the Creator God, already jealous of his minion helpers, now even more jealous of his creations. The Apocryphon of John states, At once the rest of the powers became jealous, although Adam had come into being through all of them, and they had given their power to this human, Adam was more intelligent than the creators and the first ruler. When they realized that Adam was enlightened, and could think more clearly than they, and was stripped of evil, they took and threw Adam into the lowest part of the whole material realm. The Garden of Eden was created to be a paradise of plenty, where Adam would not want for anything, and live in blissful blind ignorance. In Eden, Adam existed in a kind of sleep state, unaware of who he was or where he came from. Yahweh placed him in such a paradise, not for his pleasure, but for the express purpose that Adam would forget about his own divinity, his true heavenly home, and the one true God. The Apocryphon of John continues, The rulers took Adam and put him in paradise. They said, Eat, meaning do so in a leisurely manner, but in fact their pleasure is bitter, and their beauty is perverse. Their pleasure is a trap. Their trees are a sacrilege, their fruit is deadly poison, their promise is death. They put their tree of life in the middle of paradise. But the rulers lingered in front of what they call the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is enlightened afterthought, so that Adam might not behold its fullness and recognize his shameful nakedness. 
enlightened afterthought, hid herself within Adam. The first ruler wanted to take her from Adam's side, but enlightened afterthought cannot be apprehended. While darkness pursued her, it did not apprehend her. The first ruler removed part of Adam's power, and created another figure in the form of a female, like the image of afterthought that had appeared to him. He put the part he had taken from the power of the human being into the female creature. It did not happen, however, the way Moses said, Adam's rib. Adam saw the woman beside him. At once enlightened afterthought appeared and removed the veil that covered his mind. He sobered up from the drunkenness of darkness. He recognized his counterpart and said, This is now bone from my bones and flesh from my flesh. The demiurge removed not Adam's rib, as Moses claimed in Genesis, but a part of the light power from the monad which animated him, and it is that which animated Eve. Recognizing the pure light of the one inside her, Adam grew to know true love. Sophia successfully atoned for her accident by bringing enlightened afterthought to material creation, but the demiurge also succeeded in keeping Adam and Eve in a state of spiritual ignorance blind to their divine nature. A messenger was needed, a light-bearer from the one true God, to open their eyes. According to the Gnostic Gospels, the unknowable God sent Lucifer, an angel of pure fire and light, to show man his true origin and stir the divine spirit inside him. Jose Aragon wrote, Gnostic myths relate that Lucifer is the messenger of the unknowable God. We had said that this God, the greatest one, unreachable and unknowable, is unable to penetrate this limited universe of impure and satanic matter. But according to these myths, he can send someone, Lucifer. Gnostics consider that the biblical myth of creation can be explained as follows. The creator Satan of the world trapped Adam and Eve in his miserable world, and Lucifer, in the form of a serpent, offered them the forbidden fruit of saving Gnosis, and showed them that the creator was deceiving them. In other words, the Creator said to man, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. On the other hand, the serpent said, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The Creator lied. He said that man would die if he ate the fruit, but man did not die. The serpent was telling the truth. The Creator himself ended up agreeing that the serpent was right. Gnostics believe that this serpent, Lucifer, is the liberator of man and the world. Of course, this messenger of the unknowable God, Lucifer, is an opponent and an enemy of the Creator of this world. Gnosis states that the Creator wants to keep man captive in this limited, inferior, and impure dimension. He also forbade man contact with the higher world, represented in the biblical myth by the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But Lucifer, the angel of light, made a great sacrifice and descended into this satanic hell to give the forbidden fruit of Gnosis to man, and opened his eyes so that he would be able to remember his divine origin and his superiority in relation to the Creator. After Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, the Creator God, revealing his lack of omniscience, arrived in Eden, unable to find them. Like a master calling his servant, Jehovah beckoned, asking, Where are you? He had created humanity with the intention of indentured servitude, wanting man to be ignorant of his origins, and incapable of distinguishing between good and evil. This is why he was waiting in the garden with a death threat, falsely warning them of their demise should they dare to eat the forbidden fruit. This is also why once they did eat of the fruit, and his lie was exposed, Jehovah exiled Adam and Eve from his garden paradise and condemned humanity forever thereafter to so-called original sin. Jose Aragon wrote, Eden wasn't paradise, but just the opposite. In his book La Franque Maisonnerie, Father Leon Murin describes the Gnostic interpretations of the earthly paradise and the serpent of Genesis, and the following ideas come up. Jehovah does not want man to know his origin or his great destiny. He forbids all contact with the higher world. He wants man to be a reflection of him, the Creator, and not a reflection of the Supreme God. But man did wake up, and he did become aware of good and evil. 
Lucifer took the form of a serpent to wake man up. He is a messenger of the Supreme God, the Unknowable God. He is a messenger of the true God who came into this imperfect, inadequate, and wretched world to wake up and liberate man, to show him his true situation and what his great destiny could be like. For this reason, those who follow the orders of the Creator God consider the serpent to be something malicious and satanic, and in all this confusion liken it with Satan. On the other hand, Gnostics see the serpent Lucifer as a savior, someone who came to save man, a messenger of the true God. This serpent of enlightenment, which brought Gnosis, Gnostic truth, which allows the authentic and true nature of things to be seen, in this world of confusion, came to liberate man. So what these Roman Orthodox Christian conspirators achieved by eliminating these key books from the Bible was threefold. Firstly, and most importantly, they completely removed God from the Bible. All mentions of the one true unknowable God have been replaced by the Demiurge Jehovah. This is why the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament seem like two completely different entities, because they are. The God of the Old Testament is vindictive, genocidal, and psychopathic, whereas the God of the New Testament is loving, compassionate, and forgiving. As early Christian Gnostics like Marcion stated, the God of the Old Testament is not the God of the New Testament. They are two different gods. The first is a God who applies law and punishes, whereas the other is a God of love who always forgives. The two are irreconcilable. The good God that sent Christ the Savior to Bethlehem in the New Testament is the same good God that sent Lucifer the Savior to Eden in the Old Testament. Meanwhile, the evil God that lied to Adam and punished all of humanity thereafter for Eve's disobedience is the same evil God that ordered human and animal sacrifices and genocided humanity in the flood. It is clear that these must be two completely different entities, but Christian conspirators like Origen insisted, quote, there are not two different gods, one fair and the other good, it is the same God, and he is fair and good. This is how the unknowable God was effectively removed from the Bible, and how the Demiurge Jehovah came to be viewed as just and perfect. Secondly, if the Demiurge is now supposedly good, fair, and perfect, who is to blame for all the evil in the world? If all the divine attributes of the ethically upstanding New Testament God have been force-fit onto the morally bankrupt Old Testament God, who is the new scapegoat? The Gnostics blamed all evil, suffering, and negativity in this world on the Demiurge creator God himself, who they viewed as Satan. But the Roman Orthodox conspirators needed a new enemy, some new Satan to take his place. Who better than Lucifer, the light-bearer, the angel of light sent from the unknowable God to enlighten humanity? Thus the conspirators turned Lucifer into Satan and turned the satanic demiurge into God. Jose Aragon in The Forbidden Religion wrote, The evil of the demiurge has been taken outside to a Satan different from the Creator. Now it is this new Satan who likes blood, the smell of burnt flesh, the slaves, wars, rituals, sacrifices, conspiracies, and genocide. Now it is this new Satan who enjoys the fact that men bow down before him in adoration, and make covenants of blood pacts with him in exchange for power or earthly wealth. It is easy to discover that all the characteristics which Satan now has were taken from the Creator God of the Bible. So this is what we have. The unknowable God does not exist. His attributes have been transferred to the Demiurge, and the attributes of the Demiurge have been transferred to a Satan outside of him. What does this great conspiracy, this big scam, now need? What is lacking? is someone who we can transform this Satan into. It has to be someone who we very much hate, since Satan is the most wretched figure that we can conceive of. It occurred to someone that the most appropriate way would be to disclose the fact that this evil Satan is none other than Lucifer. In this way, not only is the Demiurge cleansed of his Satanic nature, but the figure of Lucifer is also completely distorted. The Angel of Light, sent by the unknowable God to save mankind, was transformed into a monster whose function is to keep man enslaved. Lastly, now that the one true God had been eliminated from the Bible, the satanic demiurge had co-opted all the divine attributes of God, 
and Lucifer, the monad's angel of light, had become Satan. The final change the Christian conspirators needed was to redefine hell, then blame mankind for the existence of evil. The Gnostic Gospels make it clear that this world is a broken simulation, designed by a demented designer, created by an evil creator. This dense material dimension full of suffering and death, created by the Demiurge, is the only hell. But to hide this, hell instead became another even worse place of punishment for all those who dare disobey the Demiurge. Meanwhile, the obvious imperfections and evils of this world would never be accepted as the perfect paradise of a loving, benevolent creator, so what justification could be given? Jose Aragon wrote, But how did all that perfect creation come to be transformed into something as imperfect as it is today? Here lies the brilliance of the apostles in the deception. It was man's fault that creation became impure and imperfect. The Creator, a perfect being, created the perfect world, but man ruined it. Paradise was perfect, but man and the serpent Lucifer destroyed this perfection, falling with it. So we have a good and perfect Creator who accomplished good and perfect work. All his creation, matter, time, man, were good. Paradise was a perfect place, and man lived there happily. All this went wrong and deteriorated due to the disobedience of man. To state that man is to blame for the original sin and for the fall has been one of the crudest ideas conceived against the Spirit and the true God. Man has been held responsible for the incompetence of the Creator and the shortcomings of his work. We have already seen that man was nothing more than an ignorant servant in Paradise. He ignored everything concerning himself and his Creator, as it appears he is still doing. He did not know that another God existed who was immensely superior to the Creator God. He did not know that beyond his body and soul he had a spirit imprisoned. He did not even know until he woke up and was able to rebel. For Gnosis, the only original sin that existed was that committed by the Demiurge on binding the eternal spirits to the mortal soul of man. For Gnosis, the only fall that existed, and helped along by the Demiurge, was the fall of our spirits into the hellish world of matter.